Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, welcome to our presentation today. Um, this presentation is being brought to you by the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, um, the Ar Encoded Archival Standards section, and the Description section of the Society of American Archivists. My name is Corey Neimer, and I'll be assisting with hosting today. Um, and so I'd just like to provide an introduction to our speakers. Um, today, we'll, they'll be speaking on the basics of using controlled vocabularies. Uh, and uh, our presenters include Michelle Combs, uh, lead archivist for the Special Collections and Research Center at Syracuse University, and Anna Bjornsson McCormick, librarian for Arch Archival Arrangement and Description at New York University. Um, at this point, I'll turn this over to Michelle and we'll move forward with our presentation. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Let me share my screen and we will get started. So to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, this is the first of um, a series of three webinars that we're doing on controlled vocabulary and access points. This is the intro, so this is going to be some really basic stuff, but we hope it will be useful. Um, we know that people come to uh, archives at all at all points in their career. And so for new people, this will be helpful. Uh, maybe you've been around for a while, but you haven't really used controlled vocabularies. We hope this will be um, of use to you. So that'll be the first part. The second part is going to be my co-presenter, Anna. She's going to talk about a couple of commonly used controlled vocabularies in the US, at least, and how to search and navigate them to find some terms. And then ideally, if we do this right, there will be time for questions at the end. So first off, we're going to do a real quick snapshot of where all of you are right now. So Corey's going to put up a poll. Uh, do you currently use controlled vocabularies to identify people, families, organizations, places, et cetera, in your archival description? Just yes or no. And in particular, if you've said, if you say no, we would love it if you would drop into the chat and just real briefly say why. Why not? Um, That'll be helpful to us. So we'll leave that up for uh, a bit there. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are already using control vocabularies. That's that's great. Um, hopefully, you will learn some things today as well. Okay, let's see. I don't know how to clear the poll. Corey, do you want to clear the polls <laughs> so that I can go on or close it or end it? How oh, that works. Thank you. So we close that. There we go. Okay. So real briefly, the origins of this webinar um, came about uh, because of some results some research results from a project called Building a National Finding Aid Network. This is a project that started in the US back in September 2020, and they are investigating the feasibility of uh, an archival description aggregator to support discovery where any institution across the United States could contribute their archival descriptions, kind of like WorldCat for archives. And as part of their research, they looked at uh, EAD, encoded archival description, tag usage to see what tags are in use. So what tags could then be maybe exploited by this finding aids network uh, in searches and all of that. So one of the pieces of information they found, they looked at 145,000 archival collections that were encoded in EAD uh, across 12 different regional aggregation services. And they found that the control access element, which is the specific element in EAD that is designated for putting in access points using a controlled vocabulary, they found that about 85% of the collections they analyzed were actually using this element, uh, mostly for subjects, then maybe a little bit less for names, types of material. Um, but what they found was that only about 45% of those access terms mentioned a controlled vocabulary as their source. So we, um, we looked at that and we thought, well, gosh, that's interesting. What, 
you know, what, what might cause that. Maybe people need to know a little bit more about how controlled vocabularies and access points interact um, in order to be able to use them. So that's where this, uh, that was the origins of this webinar. We thought, hey, let's, let's do something on that. Uh, based on the enrollment, it's a topic of interest and we're delighted to have so many of you here today. So first off, what are controlled vocabularies? Uh, a controlled vocabulary is, uh, it's a vocabulary that's controlled. So it's a list of standardized terms. It's controlled in the sense that there was a process in place to agree on the initial set of terms. And there is a process in place to propose and agree on any changes to that vocabulary. Uh, controlled vocabularies are what's called authorized, meaning not just anyone can contribute to them or change them, and they're available for public use. There are general purpose and specific use controlled vocabularies. Some of the general purpose ones include the Library of Congress name authority files, Library of Congress subject headings. Um, specific use vocabularies include things like the medical subject headings or the art and architecture thesaurus. There is currently, um, um, uh, uh, an intensified focus on controlled vocabularies because so many of them uh, embody or perpetuate certain biases or points of view or stereotypes. There will be more on that if that's something that interests you in the third of our three webinars, which will be looking at reparative description and controlled vocabularies. So we're talking about controlled vocabularies and access points. What are access points? They are pretty much what they sound like. They are ways into the collection. Um, when we think about access points, sort of the, the classic way of thinking about it is subject. What is this collection about? But it's important to think more broadly than that, not just the aboutness of a collection. So for example, you might have the papers of a nuclear physicist and maybe his hobby was collecting postcards with pictures of trains and his collection has 500 of these. So the collection's probably about nuclear physics and nuclear physics research, but that's a big chunk of material that might be of intense interest to people. So that's another access point into the collection, postcards, trains. Um, you might have uh, an engineering for the records of an engineering firm that happened to also do a lot of anonymous charity work. So the, the collection is about this business, but people who are interested in the interaction between the corporate world and charitable giving would be really interested. That's another way into the collection. You can also think about um, hard to find topics that might be of interest to a small group of people. For example, uh, Freemasonry. That's a topic that is of great interest to people. You might only have one or two items in a collection that relate to that, but they might be worth calling out because of how hard they are to find otherwise, and because of how, because there's a community out there that may be of interest in it. Now you may be saying to yourself, but I can do a full text search. Why do I need specific access points? Um, one example that I can give you is recently I did a search on the term green buildings because I was interested in finding collections related to buildings that were envir that are, that took environmental um, concerns into account. If I just do a search on the phrase green buildings in addition to some relevant items, I also get a whole lot of hits from uh, some of our databases that have novels in them where they talk about someone was driving past a green building or they lived in a green building. That is not helpful. Uh, by calling out specifically the phrase green building as an access point, then it enables a search engine to more tightly focus on what you want and to give you better search results. When you're thinking about access points, it's also important to think about the type of access point. For example, the word Geneva. Geneva could be a person. I actually had a friend whose name was Geneva. It could be a place in Switzerland. There's probably towns called Geneva in the United States as well. It could also be a document, the Geneva Convention. So by identifying the type of access point, again, we're making it possible to zero in better on those search results. Uh, the main types of access points are uh, people, who is what names are access points into this connection, 
uh, organizations. And although the EAD tags, which I'm showing here, the EAD tag for that is corp name, it doesn't have to be a corporation. Any organization, an orchestra, a ballet company would count as a, um, as a corp name. We can have places. We can have topics, that's the classic one, what's the subject, but everything isn't a subject and it's important to, to look at what specific type of access point you have. You can also have works, things like the Bible, the Quran. You can have uh, occupations, functions, what function resulted in the creation of this material. Um, functions are particularly interesting, but they're probably the least used type of access point. Um, but they're interesting because they give you a way of thinking about the material that's that's different from all the others. So for example, occupation might be a tax preparer, but the function might be tax assessment, just to give you a brief idea of the difference. And then of course, type of material, which for archival collections is always, always gonna be of interest to researchers. Does it have photographs? Does it have diaries? Does it have uh, correspondence? Does it have meeting minutes? All of those types of things are of interest to people. If you're thinking about a particular term that you might use as an access point and you're not sure which of these you have, uh, Mark can actually help you with that. There is this wonderful page uh, on the uh, Library of Congress that has all of these different subject added entry terms personal names, corporate names, meeting names. And for each of these, it has a full description of what this thing is. And interestingly, it also lists some of the common controlled vocabularies that you might use for it. So that is a very, uh, a very handy place to check if you want to uh, a little help figuring out what kind of access point do I have. As some of you probably know, there is also a crosswalk from Mark to EAD. So you can use Mark to help you figure out what you have. Say I have, you know, it's a it's a geographic, it's a geographic term, 651. And then I can go here and I can find out, aha, that's the geog name element. We're not going to go a lot into EAD encoding today that if you are interested in that our second webinar will be looking in more depth at that and I would encourage you to attend that one if that's of interest to you. So now we've talked about controlled vocabularies we've talked about access points, why do we want to use controlled vocabulary for access points. Um, I assume I don't have to do a real hard sell on this today. The fact that you're here means that you see some value in these two things. But briefly, there are several really solid reasons to be using a controlled vocabulary for your access points. The first one is that DAX, which describing archives, a content standard, and ISAD-G, the International Standard for Archival Description, both recommend it. They both say, if you're going to do an archival description, please give people some access points. It's really, really helpful. And using a controlled vocabulary means that they will be consistent. They will be consistent within your institution across your finding aids. But if you then contribute your finding aids to an aggregator, whether they're local, regional, or national, they will also be useful there. Consistency helps with discoverability, including faceting. I'm going to show you real quick, for example, this is our finding aids search page. And we have identified our access points and our search interface then is able to exploit that. So on the left, you see we've able to facet names of people and organizations. We've chose to merge those into a single facet. We can facet on the subjects that we've chosen. We can facet on type of material. So this enables the researcher to really narrow down and really find what they're looking for. It also, as I said, helps if you're going to contribute to aggregators like Archive Grid, the Online Archive of California, someday our National Finding Aids Network, we're hoping. Um, and it also helps you if you go, it helps you be able to reuse your data. I showed you a minute ago this mapping between EAD and MARC. One of the things that we do at Syracuse is we actually generate MARC records directly from our finding aids. So for example, here is the finding aid for a collection that we acquired recently. It's a set of photographs of Barbie dolls from the, uh, the early 1970s. So here we have added a number of access points 
using controlled vocabulary, because we've done that, those are legitimate terms for our catalog. And we were then able to directly generate a mark record directly from that. So it really enables the reuse of your, um, of your data, which, which is just incredibly valuable. We all know how much time it takes to create some of this data. And it's really nice if you, if you take that extra step of using a controlled vocabulary, it makes your data much more useful and much more flexible and much more powerful. So the next basic question that we often talk about is how many of these subject terms do, how many of these access points do I need? And the answer, like most things in archives, is it depends. It's going to depend on the size and complexity of the collection that you're describing. If it's one folder, you probably need just maybe two or three, the who, the what, and uh, maybe a, a subject term, a topic. If it's a huge collection, you're going to want a lot more. And you're going to want to think more about all the different kinds of researchers that might use it and the different ways in that they might want to have. It's going to depend on the nature of your repository. We are a general purpose repository. So if I have a collection that has photographs in it, I will probably just choose the access point photographs, which is a sort of general term. Um, Anna's going to talk in the second half, I think, a little bit about going up and down in general uh, terms and narrower terms. But if you're a photography repository, if that is your whole raison d'etre and that's what you do, you may want to use much more specific terms like silver gelatin prints or albumin prints or, you know, all of that kind of thing. So the nature of your repository is going to have some effect on that. The nature of your discovery system and how you want to use your finding aids downstream is also going to have some effect on that. As you saw, one of the things we do is generate mark records from our finding aids. So we always have that downstream use in mind when we're looking at choosing um, access terms and choosing a controlled vocabulary. The rule of thumb that I generally tell my staff and my uh, interns is ask yourself this question. If I add this access point and a researcher finds my collection using that access point through a search and they go to all the effort of contacting my public service or they come here and they hunt up the item, will they thank me and say, oh, I'm so glad that term was in there? Or will they curse me and say, you sent me all the way here for that? Or will they just be confused about why is this access point connected to this collection? So those are some ways to think about it. Um, as an example, um, you might think about a collection that has a, a letter in it from, uh, I don't know, N Nelson, Nelson Rockefeller. Very notable person, but maybe it's just a form letter that says, thank you for your note. That's it. Are you going to put his name in as an access point? Probably not, because that would probably end up in a researcher being really annoyed that they went to all the effort to find that item, and there's really not much of research value there. So that could be kind of a, a good rule of thumb to think about. Um, <clears throat> the last thing to think about is what, what also um, people sometimes say is, but I'm not a cataloger. I don't know how to choose these terms. I don't know what I'm looking at. There are a couple of tips and tricks that we've learned that you can do, because I'm not a cataloger either. I don't know LC really well. But you can exploit the work of past catalogers who are trained in doing that. So for example, that Barbie collection that I showed you, um, one of the ways that I found some good subject terms for that as I went to our library catalog and I just did a search on Barbie dolls. And when I do that search, I get some books, some electronic research. But what I can do is I can look at each of these then and I can say, okay, what are the terms that catalogers chose? Oh, women in popular culture, United States. That's good. I can, I can steal that one. Barbie dolls, social aspects. I can steal that one. So it, you can use your library catalog as a great way to try and find some of these terms or to help you find some, some useful terms that you know by definition they've been used by a cataloger, so you can be pretty sure that they're authorized. Another thing that you can use, and I hope I'm not going to cause anyone to have a heart attack here, is Wikipedia. Wikipedia has some really kind of cool things. Here's the article on Barbie dolls. Okay, lots of stuff in there. If I go all the way down to the bottom, what I find is there are some categories that Wikipedia has chosen. 
Now, this one, fashion dolls, this is really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I don't know if that's an authorized term. I would have to do a little bit more digging to check, but it's given me an idea of something to think about. Um, female characters in advertising. Another one, I didn't necessarily think of that. Now I can go and see, well, is there an authorized term that covers that? The other place that Wikipedia can be really super helpful is if you are trying to find a person and they have a really common name. So for example, we have a collection of Neil R. Jones. He's a science fiction writer. Down at the bottom of some of their articles, you'll see this little box that says authority control. And it links you to some of these controlled vocabularies. It may link you to, to, the, to VIAF or to WorldCat or some of those others. So Wikipedia can be a great way if you're, if you're not a cataloger or you're just starting out, you're not experienced thinking about access points. It can be a really great place to start. So that is a quick overview of how we got to this point and why we're doing this webinar generally how controlled vocabularies and access points interact. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-presenter to walk you through a couple of specific controlled vocabularies and how to find terms. So Anna, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you again for coming. I'm going to go through some of the kind of most commonly used resources. I will also qualify that this is in the United States. Um, a lot of these resources are used all over the world, but they are resources, you know, especially like Library of Congress, like that is part of the federal government. Um, and there are analogous vocabularies in many other countries like I know there's like Canadian subject headings and things like that but um, so yeah this is going to be focused on use in the United States just know I think a lot of the concepts kind of apply globally um, so the different sources that I'm going to talk about are the Library of Congress subject headings the Library of Congress name authority files and the Getty art and architecture thesaurus. Um, and I'll start with the Library of Congress subject headings. Uh, there are different types of terms that are included in the Library of Congress subject headings, also known as LCSH. Um, this is not an exhaustive list on this slide, but this is, you know, some of the most commonly used ones, the genre form, geographic, topical, or uniform title. Um, and then this is the corresponding mark field that they like this is the field that will be used to encode the term into a mark record so the one like this first number the 155 um, that is used that's the field that you'll find the name um, in an authority record and the 655 is the field that you would find the term if it is used as a subject in like say a bibliographic record. Um, but these are good to know because the number of the subfield can help you figure out which kind of term you're dealing with. Um, so I'm going to show you the the most common way of searching for subject terms is to go to authorities.libraryofcongress.gov. Um, this website is uh, kind of a relic of an older age in the internet, but it is still, you know, still works for our purposes. So you go to the search and this, you can search all keyword authorities if you click down here, but you can also um, limit to subject headings, names, titles, etc. So I'm going to limit this to subject headings and search for the term labor unions and see what comes up. So I get a ton of different, um, a ton of different responses to that search. And some of them are like the term that's already been subdivided. Um, there's, you know, different, different versions. One thing that it's important to always do is to look at this column on the far left that shows you whether this is an authorized heading. Um, so that's one that's like officially been recognized 
you know, as part of the LCSH, these other ones are not necessarily invalid. They're just like variations on an authorized heading. Um, and it's also good to check on the right hand side column to see what kind of heading it is. <clears throat> so if you're searching for subject headings, like a lot of them are going to be Library of Congress subject headings. You can see almost all of these down here are, but there are occasionally like the children's catalog subject headings or um, other things. And this is like, this is not to say that you can't use those, but it's just good to be aware of what you are actually using. So I clicked on the authorized term labor unions and um, this helpfully offers narrower terms. Um, you can look at the scope note, which just defines, um, not everything is a scope note, but some things do. And, and then what we wanna look at is the authority record. Um, so we want to look at the 1xx authority record. Uh, so this is the record for the term labor unions. So one thing that's helpful is here, you can see that this is in the 150 field, which means that it's a topical subject term. Um, and you can also like use, use the, the MARC website that, um, that Michelle showed to kind of like help you remember all these all these subjects or all these, you know, mark fields. Um, I know I'm also not a cataloger. I do not know them off the top of my head. I will very often just Google mark 150 field and like see what comes up. <clears throat> and that actually usually works pretty well. Um, so that will help you help tell you what kind of term it is. Up here, you have the Library of Congress control number and a permalink. So this is a URI that can always be used to identify this term. And again, in archival description, it is not required to include the control number or a URI, but it is helpful when you can. Um, and it might not be something that's necessarily like relevant to your practices like in the present moment, but if you ever do kind of want to move towards like a linked data environment, or just reusing your metadata other places that will like link out that might like link out to other resources it's really helpful to use the uris and the control numbers um okay so i will go back here and talk about the library of congress subject headings can also be subdivided um, and this is what it looks like when you saw in the search results that some terms are like separated by two dashes. That means that it's a subdivision. So again, I am going to search or, um, so this is a search I ran for labor unions, United States. Um, and this is a geographic subdivision. And I can tell that it's a geographic subdivision because again, in the 150 field, um, it is under the subheading Z and that corresponds to geographic subdivisions. Again, this is not something you have to know by heart. <laughs> you can always look it up. Um, so that is a geographic subdivision. Um, most subject terms can be subdivided geographically and you can also kind of like stretch this out if you want to or need to to say like you know we're based in new york city so we have a lot of terms that are subdivided like labor unions united states new york state new york city etc that might be overkill but it's possible um and here's a different kind of search i did for labor union mergers um so again you have the control number up here the term and You'll notice this is still in the 150 because it's still a topical term, but the sub field has changed to X, which indicates it is a topical subdivision. Um, that's just one way to kind of figure this out. Like I know also we have some legacy data with records of our um, controlled access terms that someone just kind of like copied and pasted this with with the subdivisions like included um and that doesn't really work like that's not going to display properly in a finding aid system or in a in a catalog but um when i'm cleaning that up 
like it's helpful to be able to look look up this so that you know when I'm entering it into our database, I can make sure that I am categorizing it the right way. So moving on now we will talk about um, name authority files. And name authority files are consist of um, or the most used ones are persons, families, or corporate bodies. Um, there are also authority files for like, so oh, sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. Um, there are also, you know, name authority files for in Library Congress for softwares and for some, some other things. But for the most part, as archivists, we'll be using persons, families, and corporate bodies. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of these. Again, we're going to go back to the search page. I'll also warn you this page times out pretty easily, so you might have to like refresh or go to a new search more than you would like to. Um, and here, I know I'm looking for a name authority, so I'm going to search by name authority. Begin my search. Oh, yeah, see? <laughs> I was trying to prepare ahead of time. That did not work. Um, searching by name authority. And I see this one, SAG-AFTRA organization. And SAG-AFTRA is a union for actors and other um, people in the performing arts. It's the Screen Actors Guild and the American, I don't remember what AFTRA stands for, I'm sorry. It's American Federation of um, like Television and Radio Artists. Maybe that's it, okay. <laughs> um, so again, here in this authority heading, you can see an earlier heading. Um, so these guilds did merge um, a few decades ago, and there were headings, you know, there were authority records for their previous, you know, corporate bodies, the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television Radio Artists. That can be good to know, especially if you're describing historical records that might be, you know, it might be SAG records from before the merger. Um, so you might want to be able to like disambiguate that way. Again, we look at the authority record, the 1XX field. The control number is the same at the top of the record here. Um, and this is kind of the same. You see this is in a 110 field um, with the two that that indicates indicates it's a corporate body. Um, and yeah, this that's basically it. That indicates it's a corporate body. Um, we can also look at, hold on, I'm going to need to do the refresh this, I think. So if we're looking for a person, um, I'm searching, uh, Gre I'm searching for a person called Martha Greenhouse, who is, um, a creator of one of the collections we have in our repository and what she was very involved in acting unions. So. It's really helpful. It is not strictly necessary, but it is helpful if you're searching for a name to do it in this order, last name, then first name. That turns up results just a little bit easier in my experience. So again, we're looking for the authorized heading because um, you see there's one Martha Greenhouse, 1921 and 2013. This actually is the same person, but the authority records were um, consolidated. So now that's just a reference. We want to look at the authorized heading. And again, the control number, this is a 100 with the one indicator in the first field. That means it is a person. Um, this record also includes biographical information, or it can include biographical information about the person. Um, and yeah, so this is a person. Um, one thing that is really important to remember when it comes to authority records is that, or to when it comes to um, name authorities, is that a name, a name like a person, this woman, Martha Greenhouse, can be the subject of a collection that she did not create. And even SAG-AFTRA is the subject of a collection she did create but these are not subject records. They are name authority records and you can 
encode them in such a way that they show as subjects, like at, in the access points of a finding aid or a catalog record, but the official like authority is a different thing. And that's important to remember. Um, even if you're creating your own terms or when you're looking for terms is like say an archive space, like you would need to make this into an agent record and not into a subject record. Um, okay, and then there's another thing I kind of touched on this already, but it is important to disambiguate um, with names. This is for corporate bodies and for persons and I guess families as well. Um, because there are lots of people, as Michelle noted, that have the same name. So now I am searching the name authority headings for Michael Jordan, um, beginning in search. And there are a lot of people um, who have been, you know, a public figure enough to merit an authority heading with the name Michael Jordan. How can we figure out which one is the basketball player, um, you know, who played for the Chicago Bulls? So a really good way to do this is by birth date. Um, so if you know the date that the person was born, or if you can just look it up on Wikipedia, you can disambiguate that way. So I know I'm looking for the basketball player. I will use this heading, Jordan, comma, Michael, comma, 1963. Um, and then also when you look at the authority record itself, you can kind of tell what that person was about. So, you know, it's obvious here, this is about a basketball player. Um, you might also see, let me see, like if you picked the wrong one, um, Jordan Michael 1941, you see in their authority record, it seems like they are an expert on fungi of Britain and Europe. And that is a totally different thing than basketball. Um, you could also see uh, this one down here, Jordan Michael B, um, 1987 birth date and this of course is the actor michael b jordan um and you can see here in these these fields like that he is an actor um so it's really important especially if you're including control numbers to make sure that you are choosing the right person or corporate body with a particular name um so i'm going to go Back and I'm just going to show you. So this is all using authorities.loc.gov, which if you are looking for name authority files or Library of Congress subject headings, really is like a place where I start because you know it shows the mark fields, um, which can be really helpful if you know what you're looking for. But it is also possible to use the Library of Congress um, linked data service to search terms. So this the URL for this is id.loc.gov. And it search it searches a lot of different vocabularies um, if you wanted to. So if you're looking for kind of broader terms, this is also a good place to start. And um, you don't have to like please don't be intimidated that it says linked data service. You don't have to be aiming to create linked data to use this as a search tool. So we can see here we'll search labor unions here. Um, then the schemes are over here on the left-hand side, so you can choose which one you want. So we want subject headings. That will narrow it down. Um, and then we see labor unions comes up. This is the exact same record that we saw on the authorities.loc.gov site. It's just when you click through, it still has the, the URI up here, which includes the control number, um, says it's from LCSH. It includes many of the same like much of the same information, but it's not giving you the mark fields. So um, it might be a little bit trickier to figure out like what kind of subject this is. And then this is what's really cool about the linked data service is that it gives you the broader terms, narrower terms. It also will link you to exact matching concepts or closely matching concepts. So here we see there's this is like a USDA um, controlled vocabulary it has the exact same term. Um, this has some I assume these are like this is like a French or not French German uh, word for labor unions in the German controlled vocabulary that is the very closely related. This links out to the Wikidata um, instance for labor unions. 
the world cat data or OCLC data, um, also narrower concepts from other schemes. So this, this information can be really helpful, um, I find. And it also, like if you're looking for people, so we can search Martha Greenhouse again. Um, we're looking for name authority files. And we are looking for this Martha Greenhouse. Um, this Ellen of Martha is a different person. And again, the same URI. Um, this links to other name authority files. So you can see the VF file, which is uh, virtual, virtual international authority file, which can be helpful if you're looking for somebody who, you know, is, is from a country that's different than the one your repository is in. You might have more luck searching here. Um, and again, it includes the same information um, that the other, that like the authorities.lse.gov includes, but just in a slightly different format. What is also, I think, really cool about this site is that you can download the information in your preferred metadata schema. Um, so we use Archive Space in my repository, and we are on a version that has the updated agents module, which allows you to upload Mark XML to create authority records or to enhance authority records, um, agent records, I mean. So if I download the Mark XML for Martha Greenhouse, I can then upload that into my Archive Space instance, and all of this information will be recorded, um, which can come in really handy. It's, you know, Maybe not for everything, but um, it's a good option to know about if you're using a system with those kind of capabilities. So another thing that's here that is like not necessarily used all the time, um, but is helpful is this LC demographic group terms, LCDGT. This lists a lot of um, like terms for different ethnic groups and also for different uh, professions. So we're gonna search here, watercolorists, and look at the demographic groups, which is, there's just one result. Um, and this one I wanted to show because it points directly to a source outside of the Library of Congress. The source is, the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, AAT. So that's what I'm going to move to talk about next is the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, which um, is a really helpful term, as Michelle said, for describing physical materials. Um, you know, we're all, all of us are describing objects, um, whether the objects are paper records or whether it's a trophy or photographs or an artwork. Um, in that that kind of the materiality of the objects that we have in our repositories is important to researchers and Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus is a great vocabulary to use for that purpose. Um, and I see we're running kind of long, so I'll try not to take too long. Um, and this is a thesaurus, not a vocabulary, which you know shows it's organized a little bit different. This one is organized into categories called facets. So every term falls into one of these facets. Um, and we can also look at this. This is the Getty Art and, Archi Art and Architecture Thesaurus um, search portal. I find it's a little bit picky about the terms, so you might have to try a couple times to get exactly what you want. But here we can search this watercolor um, and see we find this watercolor paint. Um, so this is a material in the materials facet. And down here, you get to see the hierarchy. So the AAT is organized into hierarchies. And this can help you to find a broader term or find a narrower term, depending on what you're looking for. So I can open this hierarchy that didn't do much. That's the bottom of the hierarchy. But here we can maybe I think it's watercolor, but maybe it's not. But I know it's a water based paint, so I can look at these other terms. Is it distemper, emulsion print, gouache, tempera? These are all water based paints. Um, so you might want to make make sure you're using, you know, the correct one. Um, 
but you also might just want to talk about paintings. So you have up here, you know, different ways of talking about paint, like paint composition or origin, function, property. So it can be interesting to kind of like navigate up and down in these hier hierarchies to find, you know, exactly what you want. Um, and these records, again, this, these also have a control number up here, the ID, they also have a URI. Um, and these are used the same ways as the control numbers and URIs in the Library of Congress um, terms. And so I just did, I did some searches to find, you know, terms related to watercolor painting in all of these different facets. So, you know, like physical attributes, some watercolor paper has deco edges. Um, watercolors can be used as contemporary in contemporary art. Um, ah, sorry. <laughs> and agents, so that's, you know, talking about persons and watercolorists are the persons and that was what was coming up in the id.lsc.gov search. Um, the material, the actual paint is watercolor paint. Objects used with that material, um, so this watercolor brushes, watercolor paper, and then there's also brand names. So Arches Paper is a brand of watercolor paper. So you can see, like, out of one kind of you know bigger concept, watercolor, there's more specific ways of like narrowing down how you what you're actually describing in the thesaurus. So that is what we have for you here today. And we still have about 10 minutes for questions. So I'm not sure. Oh, here, let me stop sharing my screen. That will help. Thanks, Anna. Um, let me just flip out screen again. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have any questions, if you could go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, so there's actually three already in the queue. So um, just to move into the first of those, um, this was from Anna Resnick asking, what are some of the best practices and thoughts with using natural language efforts to develop controlled vocabularies? Um, especially to develop local subject terms or folder names for born digital assets? Um, you know, I have never been involved in creating a controlled vocabulary. I, I am a user and I actually am doing um, name authority training. So I'm a contributor to the LC name authority files, but I'm not sure about creating like a local vocabulary. I don't have experience doing that. Michelle? No, I don't either. I can certainly see where it might be useful if you had a large enough corpus of stuff that you could sort of mine it for, for common terms. But yeah, that's not something I have any experience with either, unfortunately. Sorry, Anna. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so the second question uh, is, is maybe somewhat related. This one was coming from Mary Grace Costa asking, what do you do when you can't find a subject term or name authority in, in the Library of Congress authorities? Do you use another term as a pattern to build a new one? So I'll talk about our practices here at NYU. We do use local terms. Sometimes we are not like managing a vocabulary of them, but if if there's a subject or a person that like we just just is not in controlled vocabularies, we will kind of categorize it as a local term. That is not ideal, but it happens, you know, with some regularity. A more kind of uh, advanced way of dealing with this, what I would do if I had the time and the um, energy is you can use a resource like Wikidata and if you create a record for someone or find a record for someone in Wikidata, you can use that. So if you want a at least semi-official authority um, to link out to, anyone can create their own in Wikidata. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it, what we do is is exactly what Mary Grace said. We would find an existing one in LC, and we would use that as a pattern. A perfect example would be church names. We have a lot of collections connected with the Methodist Church in New York State. So if I don't have, if the Library of Congress doesn't have, you know, the Perryville United Methodist Church, I will find a church that is in New York that is in there, and then I can use that same pattern. Another example, our university archives has a lot of Greek organization collections with the national Greek name, and then there's usually a local chapter. That might not be an LC, but some other chapters might, and so we can use that same pattern to form our um, to form ours. We're lucky enough that one of our catalogers actually is, um, I don't remember what the name of the, the power she has is, but she can actually submit terms to LC. So sometimes we will use that to form in that pattern. We'll put it in our finding aid. Then when we generate the mark record and send her the file, she can actually get it added, which is kind of cool. It's kind of like Anna was just saying, adding something to Wikidata. So yes, patterns are good. Yeah, that is yeah, that's a good point is that if you have catalogers at your institution who are SACO or NACO trained, they can help you with this when it comes to Library of Congress. And I see the next question from Emily Dunn. Can you point us in a direction to find more information about importing Mark XML for authorities to archive space? Um, I would say you need to check the archive space documentation. They also I think I'm pretty sure they also post past webinars on YouTube and there has been, I'm almost sure in the last year or two, a webinar about the enhanced agents module. All right. And the last question that we have is from Alexandra Bush asking, do you have recommendations for how narrowly to subdivide subject headings in finding aids? <laughs> um, keeping already keeping in mind that it depends on the size and scope of the collection. Yeah, that, that's a really good question because, you know, Anna did a great job showing you the different subdivisions you could do, geographical, chronological, um, and you can get you can get really obsessive sort of over that and get really, really specific. We have sort of an informal uh, rule of thumb at our institution that we don't do more than one level of subdivision, in part because, as I showed you in our finding aid search, if we subdivided it more than that, it would wrap so much that it just visually wouldn't be very useful. But the other reason is that we're also trying to use those access points to, to gather related collections. And the narrower you get, the fewer collections that term is going to apply to. And so that's something to take into consideration in the nature of your collections, the nature of your institution. Um, for us to, to subdivide a term, you know, down to four levels, that might then only apply to one of our collections. And is that going to be useful to a researcher? It might be useful to that one researcher, but it might not be useful to other researchers who have a who are looking for a broader set of search results. Yeah, and I will say this this does apply and to some extent to using very broad terms as well. I know um, like I this is not a collection in my repository, but I've seen one. It's a photo collection. Um, of like photographs from the Arab world generally, and they were described at an item level, and um, there were subject terms attached to every single photograph. And if the photograph had people in it, the terms men and or women were applied, and that's probably too broad, <laughs> I would say, especially at an item level. Um, you know, like. I don't know how often somebody is just searching the word man um, or men, you know, that's not necessarily like someone wouldn't be using this photographing photograph collection to say like, what does a man look like? Um, so that's also another consideration you need to kind of try and find the, the, the sweet spot for, for this, like for the collection, for your repository, like say we, we have a lot of um, labor records, so unions and labor leaders. So like we might use more subdivisions for those records because we have a very large corpus of them in our collections. All right, so um, I think we have time maybe for a brief response to our last question uh, from Quinn De La Rosa. Do you have any advice for being decisive when choosing which terms to use out of the deluge of resources available? 
particularly for early career professionals who are still finding their footing with controlled vocabularies? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It, it really is kind of such an alphabet soup when you start out all these acronyms and all these vocabularies. Um, it, I would say you can't really go wrong by using something like El the Library of Congress because it's so common and it is big. It's been around a really long time. So if if you you know if you have to just choose, probably going with something like that is is a, is a good safe choice. Um, again, depending on your repository, if it's really specialized, you may need to look for a more specialized vocabulary. But that that yeah. would be my thought. I also default to Library of Congress. That's the first place I search for everything. Um, and I, I mostly just move on if the term I'm looking for is not available there, or if the term they have for a concept is like harmful or offensive, um, then that is when I search out other, other vocabularies to use. And my colleague, Rachel Searcy, is part of this webinar series and she will be talking about some of the projects we've done here at NYU in the third webinar on the series in, I think, two weeks. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I'd like to, we've reached the end of our time. So I'd like to just thank once again, Michelle and Anna for their presentations today. Um, thank you to all the participants for joining us for this session. Um, we'll be posting the recording of today's session to SAA's YouTube channel as listed here. Um, so if for those that maybe weren't able to attend, if you'd like to share this information with uh, colleagues or um, others you might work with, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, and Michelle and Anna, I, I don't remember with the with the addresses here, were you open to receiving questions as well? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to, if a question occurs to you, reach out to us. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, we're out of time, so thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending and for your questions.